Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for what you're doing in your people, Lord God. I thank you for compassion. I thank you that you are so faithful, Lord God. I thank you that you just never quit. You never give up. You're just persistent when it comes to your people, Lord God. I just thank you that you're long-suffering. You're so patient. You're so amazing. And I just thank you, Lord God, that you see us in a way that's just beyond what our minds can comprehend or wrap around. And I just thank you that you love us so much, Lord God. Help us to pull out the jewels, the gold, the treasure from these scriptures. Help us to pull out the right things out of the text, Lord God. We know that you are a God that creates. It's so amazing. In Genesis chapter 1, it says that you are spirit. And then you took on a word by saying, by saying, let there be. I love that, Lord God, that you took on word and you create by what you say and by what, what is written. I just want you to create in our lives by what is written, Father. Help us to create your kingdom and your peace and your joy and help us to manifest your spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Man, that's just mind-boggling to me. Have you guys ever thought about that? That God's a spirit and the Bible says that the first thing he does is he speaks. So he takes on word. Like, that's powerful. He just takes on word. By speaking, he becomes the word, which means that, so as a spirit to express himself, he takes on word, and now through word, he expresses himself. So it's not just a feeling now. Now it's through the word. And now when you hear the word, it's like, oh, you're hearing the spirit that you can't see. And it begins to speak, right? That's a, you, can feel, you can feel that on your skin, man, right? <clears throat> Here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's heavy. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, so I want you to know that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, which means it's the Spirit. And what he wants you to know when he says that darkness was on the face of the deep, means that there was nothing there. Um, the Hebrew word that they try to use is chaotic, but it's chaotic nothingness. So it's like if I have a blender and I tell you, this is going to sound really weird. It's like if I have a blender and I say, hey, I'm going to throw nothing in the blender and I'm going to turn it on. But you're like, wait a minute, there's nothing in the blender. So what is it that's going on? It's the chaos. It's in the nothing. That that's what's going on. It's the nothing. That's the chaotic nothing. Like there's nothing in there, right? And so he takes this chaotic nothing, and then he says, let there be. Dude, that's, that's mind-boggling to me. That's mind-boggling to me. So anyways, <clears throat> we're going to try and hear God's word today. And... Um, Today's about compassion, and if you see the word up there, that is a Greek word. I am going to slaughter it. Splagnizomai, I think that's how you say it, but it's compassion. And this compassion is a little bit different because this compassion is something that you feel on the inside of you. It's like a hurt. It's like this thing on the inside of you that says, I have to do something. That's the compassion that we're going to be talking about today. And God was so compassionate. He has so much compassion towards his creation that he had to do something. Like he was so compassionate that when man fell, there was something inside of God that said, I have to do something, <laughs> right? And we know that that carries on through the Christ. So we're going to read uh, the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. But I'm going to read it to you in its context, which means I'm going to explain to you what's actually going on, Okay. <clears throat> We're going to start at Luke 10.25. And what I want to do is when I read, when I read the, the text to you, I'm going to read it nice and slow because I want, to, I want to put you there. I want to put you on this road that he's talking about. I want to put you in the times. I want your mind to wrap around it. I want you to imagine what's going on. I want you to see it from the perspective that's being written. And guys, what you guys got to understand about the Eastern way of teaching, we're Westerners. We're being taught um, how to study in a Western fashion, Easterners do not study the way we study. What they like to do is they like to discover. And God is a God of discovery. So when you read the Bible, you're always wondering, why is he burying things? Why are things hidden? Why are things a mystery? It's because the way that he wrote the word was he wanted you to discover. He didn't want you to find. There's a difference between finding and discovering. Discovering means that you're looking. Finding is kind of you run into it. Right? And we as Christians, we want to we find things out. We want to we we see why this works and that works, but never really discovering why. 
that's the case. <clears throat> so here we go. And behold, a certain lawyer, lawyer means someone who knows the law really well, okay, whether it be a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or whatever. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> okay. So, as a Westerner, when we hear eternal life, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, he's asking, how do I get to heaven? But that is not what he's asking. Okay? I know we as Christians, when we hear eternal life, we say eternal life is when you give your life to Jesus, and when you die, you enter eternal life. This is not what he's talking about. Eternal life means life now, means abundant now. It means the way God wants me to live now, the fullness of God's kingdom now, everything that he has now. Like, how can I inherit? Right? How can I get this? How can I get what it is that God wants me to get right now? And it's called eternal life. Now, if you notice that word that he uses, he says inherit. You see that? Okay, why does he use the word inherit? Because he's Jewish. And it's his inheritance. Okay? Remember, salvation was only for the Jews. And then the Gentiles. So it's their inheritance. Their inheritance is the, what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was going to give them. It was a promise. It was an inheritance. It was land. You guys know that, right? <laughs> you guys know that? Yeah, they had land. It was an inheritance. It was land. It was property. It was things. It was physical things that they were going to get, right? Remember we talked about the story of the woman at the well that she said, our father gave us this well, you know. Are you greater than our father? Are you greater than he? Do you guys remember that story? It's pretty crazy because they're talking about what was given to them, inheritance, you know, what, what's ours, like what is ours. So he's saying, how do we inherit eternal life? Like how do we inherit this way of living? And so this is a way of living. This isn't things, Right? Because inheritance are things that you get, which are physical things. Now he's talking about inheriting eternal life, which means something that we can have, that we can live out. Does this make, see the difference? There's something that you have, and there's something that you live out. So an inheritance, and, and to inherit eternal life is how do I inherit this way of living that God wants for me that will allow me to, to be in God's favor and to live the right way? That's really what he's asking. Okay. I know most Christians are going to come after me and be like, what are you saying, Pete, that eternal life doesn't mean going to heaven? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm addressing here is this is before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which means that they didn't even know he was the Messiah yet, which means they, didn't, they couldn't even enter into God's bosom at the time. They could only enter the bosom of Abraham, which is called the righteous dead. Right? So they're not even thinking on these terms yet. They're trying to find out how they can live in this kingdom now. They want it now. Okay. We know this because he gives the parable, also gives the parable of the prodigal son. He asks for his inheritance, does he not? And he gets it. So have you noticed at the end of the story of the prodigal son, he doesn't die and go to heaven. You guys notice that? He becomes reconciled with his father and he gets it all. Right? The story is not, well, you know, then the son comes home, and then he gets old, and then he dies. And because how he treated his father, and how he repented, and how he, he asked to be forgiven, then he entered God's gracious presence and went to heaven. That's not the story, right? That's not the story. The story is he was reconciled to his father. So what's very interesting about that story is that when a person asks for an inheritance and you're still alive, that's not good, Okay? So if I have an inheritance and my son comes up to me and he says, hey, dad, um, give me my inheritance. I'm like, dude, I'm not even dead yet. I don't care. Give it to me anyways. 
I'd be like, wow, bro, like, that's very disrespectful. Like, can you at least wait till they bury me? Can you at least wait till they put me in the ground? Really what the boy was saying is, you're already dead to me anyways. I don't respect you. I don't honor you. Just give me what's due. Give me what's mine. I want what's mine, and I want to leave, and I want to get out of here. I don't want to be in your house. I don't want to stay with you. I don't want to be a part of your name. I don't want anything to do with what it is you've built. Give it to my brother. Let me have it. I want to go, right? And it, he does go. It goes on to tell us that he goes to another country. And then there's a famine that hits. And he spoils all, he, he gets rid of all his money and everything. And then a famine hits. And then he, he joins himself to a countryman. And then it says that he starts feeding swine, which you know aren't Jews because Jews don't own swine because it's a filthy animal. So you know that he's starting to join someone who's not godly, who's pagan, who's unclean, obviously, if he has swine. So he joins himself and then he comes to his senses, Right? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because in Luke 15, 20, he actually, the father has compassion. And we're talking about compassion, so I figure I'd go ahead and bring this up. It says that when the father sees him, it's very interesting because the son says that I've sinned against heaven. That's what he says. I've sinned against heaven. And we know that when you hear the word heaven, it means God because you can't say the name of God in the Bible. So usually when you hear the word heaven, it usually means God. Kingdom of heaven means kingdom of God. Because they don't say the name of God. Right. So he says that and he says, hey, hire me on. And it's very interesting because the father sees him, sees him coming far off and he has compassion and he runs to him. Which is very interesting. Right. It's all about compassion. And this is very interesting because you're thinking, why does the dad get mad? Because there's that word compassion. When that word compassion is there, you can't get mad because there's something inside of you that's moving you. There's something inside you that says, I have to do something. And what does the father do? He puts the robe on him, puts the ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and he throws his party. And we know that his brother doesn't like it. We don't even know if he even enters or not, you know. And that's what ends up happening there. But let me keep going here. <clears throat> so the inheritance there was what? What was the inheritance that he got? Remember, he got the first inheritance. What was the first inheritance? Everything that he wanted. Everything that he thought he needed. Did you guys notice that? That was the inheritance. Give me what's mine. Give me, and see, that's the Jewish people. The Jewish people feel entitled. Look, because I'm of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's mine. Because I'm a child of God, this is mine. It's mine. Right? Do you hear when Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen? That's a slap in the face. Because what he's saying is like, you're all called, but you're not all going to get it. Right? You're not all going to get it. You're not all going to enter. Everyone says, Lord, Lord. You know, if you call me Lord, Lord, why do why you call me Lord and not do what I say? So he says, you're all called, but you're not all going to be chosen. You're not all going to enter. You're not all going to come in. Why not? Because you think you're entitled, and this isn't about what you think. This is about having compassion. This is about doing what I said, and this is what this whole story is about. And so when they ask him this, he's trying to tempt them. And so all that's coming into play. And he says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, first of all, if it's an inheritance, what do you mean, what do I have to do? You see that? You see what he did? He's trying to trap him. If it's an inheritance, you don't have to do anything. You see that? <laughs> right off the bat, trying to trap him. You just said it was an inheritance. Now you're saying we have to do something. So which one is it? Do we get it or do we have to do something? Do you see how he's doing that? This is what I love about the scriptures because the way they're written down is if you don't pay attention, they'll go right over your head. You won't understand what's going on. So Jesus knows what's going on. He sees it. He sees it right away. And he said unto him, watch this, what is written in the law? He's asking him a question, right, which means you got to answer now. How readest thou? Which means, what's written in the law? And how do you read it? That's two questions. So, what is written and how do you read it? Meaning, how do you read the law and what is your lens? How do you see it? What, what do you get from that? That's what he's asking him. What do you get from it? Right? Watch. And he said unto him, what is written in the law and how you read it? And he answered and said, thou shalt love the Lord. So really, here's what he's asking. There's two houses. There's two houses. You guys remember the two houses? What are the two houses? Do you guys know them? 
Let's see if you guys remember. You don't remember? Nathan, what are the two houses? The house of Hillel and the house of Shammai. Okay? He's asking them, who do you, who do you side with? Shammai or Hillel? Now remember, Hillel is the house of love. They say to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your might, and to love your neighbors yourself. That's the house of Hillel. The house of Shammai is more legalistic, and they say to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your might, and follow the law. So he's asking him, what side are you on? Where are you at? And so he tells him right here. He tells him that he, he sides with Hillel. Okay? He says, thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and not thy neighbor as thyself. Now remember, they also ask Jesus this question. What are the two greatest commandments? And he answers the same thing because he also sides with the house of Hillel. Okay? So Jesus gives the same answer. So he's like, we're in agreement here. We can both agree on this. We can both agree that the greatest commandments are to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, with all your mind, with everything that you have, and to love your neighbor. So we're in agreement, right? We're in agreement? And the guy's like, yeah, okay, we're in agreement. Okay, let's move on now. We can agree on this. Now let's go into the story. <laughs> I love the way he does that. So he said, let's find common ground. You know, if you can find common ground with somebody, just find common ground. Say, hey, let's find a common ground. Um, When I was in Florida, I'll give you a perfect example. When I was in Florida, um, we were out ministering, and these women were dressed, if they were even dressed. I don't know what it was, but it was crazy, right? I mean, it was like, I didn't know where to look. You know, Nathan and I were walking around, and we're like, okay, I can't look there, can't look there. Can't look there. Can't look. I'm like, what is going on? I look at my camera. I look at my watch. I look at my phone. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Right? And they were, like, making sure you could see. Right? They were making sure you could see. And I'm like, so this girl, there's this guy there with the, the God Squad. There's a God Squad group that goes out there, and they go out there every year. Um, and there's a guy. He's standing there. And he's ministering. There's a lot of people ministering, and they have these shirts on. And um, so this girl goes up to him, and I'm standing there. And the girl goes up to him and says, so, uh, so God and Jesus, right, why would God kill his own son? Is God God? Is Jesus God? If he is God, why would he send himself to kill himself? Like she's trying to get into this debate with him, right? And he almost bit into it. Uh, Nathan, my friend, uh, said, hey, man, don't do it. It's a trap. It's a trap, right? She's trying to get him into a, uh, uh, she's trying to, to tempt him, right, like this. And so he's about to engage, and I stopped him, and I said, hey, bro, um, let her talk. Let's find out where she's at. Let her just put all her cards on the table, man, right? Let her put so she starts putting all her cards on the table. So I said, okay, so we can agree on this, this, and this. She's like, yeah. So then I started explaining to her, started explaining to her that God was married to Israel and in order for Israel to be uh, to enter into the new covenant, the first husband has to die. But it's impossible for God to die because he lives forever. So how, how does he die? He has to come as a man. And he has to come as a man and die physically so they can be free from the old covenant, enter the new covenant, which is what Romans is talking about where he says that um, unless the husband dies, they can't be free to marry another. So I said he had to come and die like that. That way they can marry into the new covenant, which is... The reason why we can all be saved now because it was for the Jews and now it's for everyone because of that. And so then it made sense to her. And then within five minutes, she's crying. She's crying. I'm sitting there. She's crying. She has her head on my shoulder. I'm like, hey, she's crying. And the guy stands there um, after they leave and he says, that's what I want to do. I want to minister like that. I want to be able to minister like, because you could feel the Holy Ghost. It was like all over me. It was over her. It was over everybody who was watching. And he's like, I want that. I want to experience that. I want to minister like that. And I said, the only way you can minister like that is if you have compassion, man. You got to hear them out. You got to listen. Got to love on them. Can't try to correct them. Then why you're here, you're not here to correct them. You're here to love them. And you overcome evil with good, right? And so this is what's going on here. Here we go. 
But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> this is very interesting. It's like if I say this. Um, to inherit eternal life, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the answer. Let's not forget what the question is. The question is, how do I inherit eternal life? That's the question. Jesus is answering the question with a parable. He's not saying, hey, let's just be good to everybody. He's not saying, hey, you know, I took your question, I heard it, but hey, let me tell you how to be a good person now. Let me tell you what you do if you see someone beat up on the side. This is not what this is about. He's trying to show them how to inherit the kingdom of God. How do we to enter eternal life? Which is very mind-boggling because how is it that this story teaches you how to enter eternal life? How does this story do it? Because this is about doing something. We've always heard that salvation is about what Jesus did, right? But why is he saying, okay, I'm going to tell you a story, right? Because you're asking me who your neighbor is. You're asking me who, who am I supposed to love, Jesus? That's very interesting, like, let me put it to you like this. Let's say that you were to ask me, or I was ask you. Okay, I'm asking you. Hey, um, hey, Amos, uh, what must I do to, eternal, to, to enter eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And then you say, um, oh, you got to love your neighbors yourself. And then I go, okay, so who's my neighbor? Meaning that you got to tell me who to love and who not to love. Because I don't know who to love and who not to love. You have to tell me. Tell me who and I'll go love them. You tell me. That's very interesting. Right? That's like if I say, hey, go be nice to some people. Then you say, okay, who do I be nice to? Be nice to everybody. Okay, when you say everybody, who's everybody? <laughs> See what I'm saying? Tell me who you mean by everybody. Okay, so now remember this. When he says neighbor, this is what we don't understand. He's talking about Jews here. Not Gentiles, okay? Because your neighbor, according to the word, are people who are proselytes, who are people who came in into Judaism. It's never the pagans. Never the pagans. It's always the people who come into Judaism and people who are in agreement with you. These are your neighbors. The people that you're with, the people that you eat with, the people that you're around, the people that you're in covenant with, whether it be your nation, uh, the kingdom of Israel, whether it be Judah, whether it be Israel, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, but all those that are in communion. That's what he's saying. Love them. So basically, you got to love your brother. You got to love anyone who, who loves the same God we love, you got to love. That's what he's saying. We're in agreement. Did you notice he started with, where are we at? Let's come into agreement. What are the two greatest commandments? Okay, cool. We agree on that. You see how he did that? So we agree on that. Okay, so now let's agree that we love our neighbors or the people that love God. So let's agree on that. So we agree on this. Love the Lord, which means we got to love God first, and then love the people that love God. Are we in agreement? Yes. Okay, so here it is. Love God then love the people who love God. And then he says, okay, so who's my neighbor? And he's like, dang, okay, I just gave you the answer, but let's go a little further. Let's talk about who it is that you need to love, okay, which is very interesting. Hey, guys, thank you. Thank you for stopping by. Please subscribe to my channel. If you liked it, please leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought about this content, about this video. And uh, please don't be afraid to share this. And if you like this, go ahead and hit that like button, thumbs up, and uh, don't forget to turn your notifications on. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you for being a part of Royal Family International University. Don't forget to turn your notifications on.